Turn, if you will, to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians 2, and we're going to read verses 5 through 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And I don't know how long this will go today. Probably not a lengthy sermon, but hopefully it'll be very helpful. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. A couple weeks ago, I wanted to focus on the person of Jesus Christ a little more closely. Sometimes we get sidetracked in what we do from week to week. And we considered his complete deity before the heaven and the earth were created. And we discussed his physical birth in Bethlehem when he entered time and space. God has revealed himself in the Bible in three persons which constitute one God, what the Bible calls the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what the world knows as the Trinity. But why was it necessary for God in spirit form to take on a human body. And that's what I want to examine today. I call this God was manifest in the flesh. Amen. God was manifest in the flesh. First Timothy 3 verse 16 says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then lastly received up into glory. All the modern versions have rewritten that. They no longer say God was manifest in the flesh, but rather he who was manifest, without telling you who was manifest. They are getting people who profess to be Christians ready to receive an imposter. A man named Paul Henry Spack, S-P-A-A-K, he was once the prime minister of a little country called Belgium. Uh, Belgium is right across the English Channel to the east of Great Britain, and it's a small country bordered around its edges by the Netherlands, or Holland, and another small country called Luxembourg, Germany, and France to its south. Uh, but Mr. Spack uh, was not only the Prime Minister of Belgium, he was also one of the early founders of the European Union, which uh, Great Britain just voted to get out of Brexit. And he said these words, We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. I remember my father quoting Mr. Spack's words from this pulpit 40 years ago when he was the pastor here. See, Bible believers have always been ahead of the curve. We, always, we, we know what's coming to the world. And the technology, of course, has just been moving more rapidly in that direction. That was, of course, said before the days of the Internet, before the days of uh, personal computers, PCs, or smartphones, uh, and any number of uh, ways we communicate these days. Your King James Bible calls Jesus Christ the bright and morning star, Revelation 22, verse 16. Also, Numbers 24, verse 17. The New International Version and the English Standard Version and other new translations refer to Satan as the bright morning star, Isaiah 14, verse 12. I had a minister friend of mine who I met through my week job, my weekly job, 
And he said to me several years ago, uh, are you still hung up on the King James Bible? And I said, are you still testing positive for NIV? <laughs> he had to sort of laugh it off. I don't think he appreciated it at all. <laughs> Satan will eventually appear in the flesh and deceive the world. But why was it necessary for Jesus Christ to take on human form? I alluded to the answer to that recently when I said, when you call on God for help, when you are facing trouble and you want God to do something about it, God can't very well say to you, I understand, or I know what you're going through. If he's never gone through anything, but through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God can say, I understand. He can say, I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be thirsty. I know what it is to be cold. I know what it is to be talked about. I know what it is to be gossiped about. I know what it is to be mocked and ridiculed. I know what it is to lose a loved one and, and no sadness. I know what it is to have my own family reject me and my closest friends desert me. So now God understands the sorrow and the disappointments that come in human life because he's been there too. Right. Now, initially, the Godhead was all spirit form. The Bible says God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse 24. The Holy Spirit, well, that's self-explanatory. But the Lord Jesus Christ was also a spirit at one time. The verse, or verse 6 in our text says, Who being in the form of God, past tense, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ wasn't blaspheming later when he said, I and my Father are one. John 10 verse 30. He even prayed, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. John 17, verse 5. But in a manger in Bethlehem, God was manifest in the flesh. He came into the world in human form. The prophet Isaiah seemed to be speaking for Christ or as Christ and the Godhead, in Isaiah 6, verses 8 and 9, we read this. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. And we know that he was speaking uh, in the person of Christ because later Christ would say, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Matthew 13, verse 13. But the entire Godhead was once in spirit form. But beside coming into the world to identify with the lives of men, for what other reason? was God manifest in the flesh. Well, God was manifest in the flesh, first of all, because of your sin. God had placed man and woman in the Garden of Eden with one restriction. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, verse 17. And the serpent appealed to the woman... And said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Genesis 3.1. The first time he speaks in the Bible, he questions the words of God. That should be very instructive about him and his character. Christ said in John 8, verse 44, He was a liar and the father of it. He tried to reassure the woman that it would be okay. Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6 there tells us, 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also under her husband with her, and he did eat. She believed the sales pitch of Satan. It was good for food, probably true, and pleasant to the eyes, undoubtedly true, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She talked herself into that. People can rationalize and justify any decision they want to make. And together, instead of listening to God, they listen to the devil. They listen to the devil. Their act of sinning against God brought his judgment on the whole human race which would follow. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, Romans 5, verse 12 tells us. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, therefore, or rather, so by the obedience of one Christ shall many be made righteous, Romans 5, verse 19. Sin revealed a, a disobedient nature in man, and it cost him paradise. It cost him paradise, and he's been trying to get back to it ever since. You know... Those who have no real faith in God, they certainly claim no faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They put all their hope and their um, desires in this world and in this life and in this environment and, and these circumstances and in and this existence right here because this is all they've got. And uh, they're trying to work as little as possible. They're trying to wear as little clothing as possible. They're trying to do as as little as they have to do and make life perfect for themselves and they keep trying different political approaches thinking that will solve the dilemma you cannot legislate away uh, human desire you cannot socialize away the the uh, interest in human competition every parent wants to achieve a little bit more if they can than their pre than their parents did and uh, so on and so on, that every generation thinks the same way. It's kind of like um, people who complain about their kids' rock music. And someone says, well, every generation has felt the same way about their children's music. Well, is it possible that every generation has been right? Maybe it has been going downhill ever since the garden. But God cursed the earth because of man's sin. Sin poisoned everything, and something needed to be done about it. But God was manifest in the flesh because of sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. Secondly, God was manifest in the flesh because animal sacrifices were only temporary. After their sin and disobedience, the Bible says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Genesis 3, verse 21. An animal had to be slain to supply those skins. It's a great foreshadow of the death of Jesus Christ one day. We read Revelation 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The animal, the Lamb, slain to provide skins for Adam and Eve was a preview of the eventual death of Jesus Christ. Its death covered their guilt as a substitute for them. Its skin covered their nakedness, but it wasn't enough to get them back in the garden. And it didn't reverse the curse God had already made on the earth because of their sin. Uh, it couldn't take away their sin or clear their record. But the shedding of blood would be the act of obedience required for any subsequent sins in the future. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Leviticus 17 Verse 11, 
God had given man authority over the animals. Uh, God told him in the end of Genesis 1, verse 28, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. If the life of the flesh is in the blood, then sin and guilt and the death of the flesh are going to be connected to blood as well. But the animals were never equal to man in value. And uh, the animal's flesh was not like the flesh of man. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39. Slaying an animal as payment for your sin was an act of obedience to God. It would establish you as righteous if you were faithful to do it. Moses told the Israelites, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. The Bible says of John the Baptist's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, before John the Baptist was, was born, still living in Old Testament times. They were both righteous before God. How? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Luke 1, verse 6. Slaying an animal as payment for your sin was an act of obedience. But in the big picture, alongside God, Isaiah writes, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6. The laws and commandments and animal sacrifices could clear, couldn't clear your name permanently. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Hebrews 10, verse 4. God was manifest in the flesh because the animal sacrifices were only temporary. And that leads me to my last point. Point number three. God was manifest in the flesh because only a permanent sacrifice would do. Only a permanent sacrifice would do. Because the blood of an animal couldn't uh, erase the guilt of a man. What he needed uh, was a sacrifice that was not only equal to him in value, but greater than him in value. So that it could cover all of his sins, past, present, and future, if necessary. And I got to tell you, it's necessary. <laughs> John writes to believers, if we, Christians, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John, 1 John 1, 9. So yes, it had to be sufficient to cover his present and past sins, but also any that would come in the future. Uh, just like Isaiah speaking on behalf of Christ, the writer of Hebrews in a similar way says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. That's God the Father. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written, to do thy will, O God. Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 7. The Bible says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Galatians 4, verse 4. John the Baptist saw Christ approaching, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. His sacrifice would do what the animal sacrifices could not do. The death of Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, did not come as a surprise to Jesus Christ. It was part of the plan of God ever since the fall of man. So Acts 2 verse 23 states, Him, Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. The wicked only did to Christ what God had planned from the beginning. His death on the cross, uh, the shedding of his blood, was the payment for the guilt of your sin. 
the consequence of your sin, the results of your sin, the fact of your sin. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold received by tradition from your fathers, but ye were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 to 20. Since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, no other person could take your place and take the judgment for your sin as your substitute because he or she would already have their own sins to worry about. You needed a sacrifice that was free from any blemish. And so Jesus Christ came into the world, God manifest in the flesh. We've already discussed him coming so he could walk among men, he could live among men, he could identify with men. He knows what men go through. Yet never committing a sin, he had nothing that needed to be forgiven. No sin that needed to be forgiven, no sin that needed to be punished, no sin that needed a sacrifice uh, in the temple. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verse 6. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, verse 22. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Hebrews 4, or rather 1 Peter 3, 18. And Hebrews 4, 15 says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. It's hard for you to wrap your mind around uh, a being who could live as a man in every sense of the word, yet without sin in thought, word, or deed. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, verses 11 and 12. If Christ could be sacrificed again, or if Christ needed to be sacrificed again for sins, then his death was no more powerful, it was no more effective than the animals in the, in the temple, the animals in the tabernacle that needed to be repeated again and again. Notice at the end of our text this morning, Philippians 2 and verses 9, 10, and 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God in Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. I'm so glad that he was, and I'm so glad that I've trusted him. 